Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, I, I guess as the lead off hitter on this panel, um, I want to spend my time talking a little bit about um, that part of the title, which is uh, the age of political polarization. On the surface, I think there is a fairly broad consensus that the American political system, and particularly our national politics centered here in Washington, D.C., has become increasingly dysfunctional. Um, increasing political polarization has led to good luck in our national government um, and to a pervasive political distemper that alienates Americans from the political process. Education policy, traditionally bipartisan, has been the collateral damage of that process. One need only think of the nature of the debates around the Common Core, which I think Danielle will talk a little bit more about, um, or the repeated failure of prior attempts to fix what virtually everyone agrees are serious flaws in No Child Left Behind to be reminded of the effects of this political climate on educational policy. But beneath the surface, there is some considerable dis disagreement, I would suggest, over the causes of the current state of our politics and thus of the potential ways forward. The dominant narrative posits a golden age of bipartisanship within American politics, during which both of the major political parties had a range of political ideologies within them, and political deals were commonly struck across the aisle. In this perspective, the problem of our current state of politics is its partisanship, the emergence of political parties polarized to the right and to the left. What is needed in this view is a restoration of a vital political center. I am going to argue that this is a misunderstanding of the nature of our problem and provides no viable solution to the dilemmas we face. In fact, as many political scientists have noted, partisanship plays an important role in a democratic political system. It is the means of aggregating individual political and policy preferences into competing political organizations, political organizations which are essential to democratic elections and to democratic legislation. Indeed, studies have shown that sentiments of political partisanship are highly correlated with active participation in the political process. Other democratic systems around the world have long had political parties of the right and the left, highly partisan in nature, without devolving into the dysfunctional state of contemporary American politics. The problem in American politics is not political partisanship per se, but how political contention and how political opposition is conceived and organized. Increasingly, rather than seeing one's political opponent as a necessary and legitimate part of a system that requires open debate and deliberation, one's political adversaries are being cast as somehow fundamentally illegitimate. I mention here only one example because of how well it captures the phenomena. The attacks on President Obama as having been not born in the United States, of being a secret Muslim, being pals with terrorists, and a closet communist. These attacks are not simply a part of what Richard Hofstetter once described as the paranoid style in American politics. They are attacks on the very legitimacy of Obama as president, um, that he is somehow not fit to be the President of the United States, despite having won two elections by substantial margins. Underlying this is a notion of politics which was perhaps best conceptualized by the authoritarian German political thinker Carl Schmitt when he said that politics was founded on the opposition of the friend and the enemy. The notion that, that, that those with whom you disagree over politics and policy are not simply political opponents with as much right as you to engage in democratic debate and deliberation, with as much right as you when elected to govern, but rather political enemies which must be eliminated from politics and government altogether. That notion is at the core of what ails American politics today. 
And I would suggest to you that that notion um, is what lies behind the current spate of voter suppression laws and of union suppression laws. The notion that there are, are people and that there are institutions which are not legitimate parts of the political process and they must be eviscerated and eliminated from politics. To understand its development and why this has come to play the central role in American politics that is had, um, one, one must see what is mistakenly posited as a golden age of bipartisanship in American politics, as an era when the Democratic Party was an amalgam of northern liberals with strong labor backing and Dixiecrats who were arch segregationists. Um, for those who have nostalgia for this era, I would say I do have some nostalgia for a Republican Party that could have a Mayor LaGuardia of New York City and nostalgia for a Republican Party that could have a Senator Javits of New York State. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, both of those uh, officials were people that received strong backing from teacher unions in their various elections. And part of the dilemma that teacher unions face today um, in keeping the Democratic Party honest, if you will, is the lack of such figures um, in the Republican Party. However, I have no nostalgia um, for the Democratic Party with Dixiecrats in it. Um, the civil rights movement of the 1960s began a realignment of American politics that drove the Dixiecrats from it. Um, and one can think here um, of Strom Thurmond as a kind of um, archetypal figure, um, beginning as a Democrat, um, leaving the Democratic Party in 1948 um, when Hubert Humphrey got the first civil rights plank into the Democratic Party platform. Um, and, and leaving as a result of the civil rights movement, um, the Democratic Party increasingly being a party of liberals and of the left, broadly speaking. Um, one thinks of what Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, which was he had lost the South for the Democrats for at least a generation. Um, and, and so at the same time that the Democratic Party aligns to the left, the Republican Party aligns into the right. I would suggest to you today that the Tea Party are the descendants of the Dixiecrats. Um, education was central to that realignment. The battles over school desegregation from Brown B Board of Education forward were a central component of the civil rights movement. Although they began in the South, they also took on a northern caste as well. This is indeed a national phenomenon that we're talking about. Today, um, the public schools in my native state of New York are the most economically and racially segregated public schools in the nation, more so than Mississippi. Um, and so that element um, plays a, a particularly important role. Um, it may be possible to do discrete, carefully circumscribed bipartisan legislation, um, such as what now may be happening with ESEA reauthorization. Um, certainly the first step of a bipartisan bill coming out of the Senate committee with a unanimous vote of Democratic and Republican members has surprised, surprised many political observers. Um, but it is indeed only the first step in that process, um, and we will have to see um, if it can be carried to completion. But I would argue that even if that happens, um, it will be an isolated phenomena, and that the larger problem of our political culture and of how we move educational policy forward won't be solved until we're able to complete the alignment of American politics and that will require addressing the central place of race in American political economy. Let me simply say, um, to, to, as a conclusion here, um, that at that moment of the civil rights movement, um, when the Dixiecrats left the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party became a party of liberalism, um, there was a, a vision put forward, um, particularly by A. Philip Randolph, um, the great um, historic trade union leader, um, the first uh, African-American leader of a trade union in the United States, um, 
that, that there was a vision forward um, that would be a political project which would be multiracial but class-based. Um, the idea was the Democratic Party would be realigned into something closer to the social democratic parties of Europe and other parts of the world. Um, and I think what happened indeed was that that political project was stalled. Um, and so instead, what we have seen happen in the 50 years since that movement is much more of multi-class race-based politics occurring in the United States. And the political polarization um, that we're talking about, and I think one of the reasons why um, Barack Obama plays this important role in it is because he is the first African-American president. That political polarization um, is in large part a function of the multi-class race-based politics. Um, and that's what has to be overcome for us to move forward in educational and economic policy.